He's a real theologian, a scholar. He's written over 40 books. I have some of his books linked down below. He has a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures from New York University. He's been an adjunct professor at many universities and seminaries. He's debated Jewish rabbis, gay activists, um, professors that are agnostic. I mean, you name it, he's debated it. He's one of the most well-respected apologists of our time. He's a general, not only in all of these things academically, but he's a revivalist, guys. He's charismatic, he's spirit-filled, he believes in the move of God. He believes in revival. And without all that being said, please help me welcome on tonight, Dr. Michael Brown. Great to be with you, man. Thanks Dr. for having Michael me. Dr. Michael Brown, I'm so excited to have you on. It is a major <laughs> honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Oh, it's my joy. And I'm, I'm loving the energy of your audience already. Let, let's do this. Awesome. I'm super excited. So I kind of just wanted to give you the backdrop and then give everybody watching just the backdrop from my position. As you know, I've taught a pre-tribulation rapture as of recently. I've been watching your stuff and I'm rethinking. I'm saying, Lord, I want to be biblical, not right. I don't have an interest in being the guy that's right. Like I know it. Nobody else knows it. I want to be integral to the scripture. And so I believe tonight, maybe this is weird. You probably say, I've never had a request where someone said, come on and prove me wrong. But I really do feel that tonight I want to humble myself. You're just you know, you've been studying this stuff longer than I've been alive. And I really believe that you have so much to bring to our audience, to this idea. And uh, one thing I will say, Dr. Brown, while I was teaching through my book of Revelation that I did for about two and a half months, this is one thing, Dr. Brown, I couldn't reconcile. I couldn't reconcile that there was a rapture before the tribulation. Then there was a second coming. Because in my mind, I was thinking, even as I was teaching it, this is like three comings of Christ, right? There's like, Jesus comes as the Messiah, he dies, and then he comes in the rapture, and then he comes back again a third time. So that was one struggle that I had when I was preaching pre-tribulation. I think that um, it's the general idea that most people preach. And for me, and I'll just be honest, I think what happens is we become echo chambers. So we preach pre-trib, and then, you know, I watch a video of a guy preach it, and then I read a book about it, and then I start repeating it. But in my mind, it, there was some areas that I felt like I had to keep changing the narrative throughout the book of Revelation as I taught it to try to fit it into the pre-trib idea rather than say, let the text speak for itself. And so I'm, my heart is open. You know, I'm, I'm just so honored to have you on tonight. I'm so excited to have you on tonight. I know people get stirred up about this. I want to be biblical, not be right all the time. And so I think everyone in the chat, everybody watching the several thousand of you that are already on, I would challenge you to humble yourself, to come with the contrite spirit and just really be teachable um, tonight. So Dr. Brown, if you don't mind, maybe just share a little bit about you, who you are, maybe some of your testimony before we jump into this. That'd be awesome. Sure. I'm, I'm a Jewish believer in Jesus. My testimony is literally from LSD to PhD. I got wow. saved in 1971 as a heroin shooting LSD using 16-year-old Jewish hippie rock drummer. I went to a little church to pull my best friends out, and God began to deal with me and change my life radically and dramatically. So I got saved. I got, I got born again. I got set free. And when my dad saw that I was off drugs, he said, you know, Michael, it's great you're off drugs, but we're Jews. We don't believe this. So he brought me to meet the local rabbi who befriended me and then began to challenge me. You know, you don't even know Hebrew. Who are you to tell us what to believe? So that's why I ended up majoring in Hebrew in college and then ultimately earning a PhD in Semitic languages from New York University, because I, I wanted to be able to dig into the text as best as I could, the Hebrew Bible in particular, and not have to rely on what a commentary said, mm. what a rabbi said or even what a dictionary said. In other words, I, I could come to my own conclusions just like other scholars. So that's been part of my life, you know, the academic work. I've written commentaries on Jeremiah and Job. I'm working on Isaiah now. Uh, and, and then did a lot of academic work, taught at seminaries. But also it's been part of my life for 50 years now, Jewish outreach. So I've written multiple books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus uh, my, my YouTube channel, Ask Dr. Brown, you find a lot of debates I've done with, with rabbis and things like that. So that's an ongoing part of my life, reaching Jewish people with the good news of the Messiah, equipping the church to reach out. But you know, Isaiah, when, when you get radically saved and encounter God in a real powerful way, traditional religion alone is not going to do it. Mm. Just going to church is not going to do it. There, there must be ongoing encounter with God. So revival has been a great theme of my heart and life as well. So redemption in Israel is one of our major ministry emphases, and then revival in the church. I was privileged to serve as a leader in the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola from 96 to 2000. I'm an eyewitness 
to what God can do with the supernatural outpouring. So that has burned in me through the decades, the, the wake-up call to the church, the call to repentance, to encounter God afresh, and then we touch a dying world around us and bring that message to the nations. I also believe that a church that is alive, a church that is shining bright, Come on. should have a positive impact on the world around us. That so rather good. than the world changing us, the church through the gospel should bring about change where we live. And because of that, the third R in our ministry, revival in the church, and then the, the last is, is redemption in Israel. The middle one, which I'm giving last now, is a gospel-based moral and cultural revolution in society, where as a result of revival and awakening in the church, the culture, the world around us has actually changed. I, I burn with these wow. things. Day and I do a, a live radio broadcast that we stream as well, the line of fire five days a week. It's live call in. So we get to interact with people from every background and then normally write five articles a week. So whatever's happening in the world around us, I'm normally commenting on that and posting it. So, folks, the, the links are in the description there. You can uh, sign up for our emails. You can join our YouTube channel. But we're, we're pouring out, just like you, Isaiah, trying to pour out so information, good. get it out freely to the maximum number of people so that, that we, the people of God, can make a difference. So good, Dr. Brown. Really good stuff. Um, make sure, guys, you subscribe. I've, I've linked his channel down below. I actually have a special link to where if you click it, it'll pop up saying subscribe. So you can just right there. We try to make it as easy as possible for you guys. So make sure that before the night's over, that every single one of you watching, maybe if you're on Spotify, Google Play, Charisma Podcast listening, go, go, to, the go to the channel and get that link um, and subscribe. Dr. Brown, why do you think pre-tribulation is so popular in today's culture? And why are people so zealous to defend it? You know, again, I've preached this, but I'm not zealous to sit here and debate back and forth about something that's not found in the Bible, as you've said in your in your um, debates, in your book, and in your teachings. Is this a salvation issue? Why do you think it's such a popular doctrine in the church? Right, it's definitely not a salvation issue, for sure. And I, I have close friends that are pre-trib. We've worked together for decades. I have others that I preached for many, many, many times. And I don't even know where they stand on it. In other words, it's never come up. There are people I've ministered with side by side for years, and the debate never came up. We preach the second coming. We, mm. we live in readiness, but it never came up. So it's certainly not a salvation issue, and I'm not going to divide over it or even be divisive over it. As to why it's so popular, well, it's been popularized. In, mm. in other words, uh, beginning with the, the Schofield Reference Bible over 100 years ago, this was widely used, and people often think the notes in the Bible are just as inspired as the text in the Bible. Wow. So people thought, oh, that's what it means. And then Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in the late 1960s became an international bestseller. And then the Left Behind series, the novel. And then it's been made into movies. So the whole thing, you know, just we're going to be, you know, flying on the plane and suddenly the pilot's going to disappear and half the people or you're going to be playing baseball and the pitch comes in and suddenly the batter disappears and four of the umpires. It's, it's a dramatic thing that 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 fits well in movies and, and sensationalism. So I'm not saying people believe it because they want to be sensational. I'm saying it's the kind of thing that's easily popularized. And because of these best selling books and these popular movies, it's gotten out to the point that people think this is essential gospel. The fact is, there is no major church leader in history. Let me say it again. No wow. major church leader in history who preached anything that can be called a pre-trib rapture prior to the mid-1800s. So that alone would just make you wonder, where did it come from then? And why is it that consistently when you read the disciples of the apostles and their disciples, they're not infallible. I understand that. I do not hold to the authority of church tradition. But you have to wonder why all of them that talked about this were expecting to live through final tribulation, if it happened. And we're expecting to see an antichrist, and we're expecting Jesus to come after those things. You have to wonder, how did they all get it so wrong if they were so close wow. to the apostles and their disciples? So it does raise questions. I can say for me, that I literally heard that before I clearly heard the gospel because it wow. was being taught a lot in the church where, where my friends started going and they would bring it back and talk to me about it. And, wow. It's fascinating. I didn't know this and stuff from the book of revelation. So I believe I heard that first. And then I heard the saving message of Jesus. So when I got saved, I just thought, this is it. This is the doctrine. This is what we believe. 
Wow, so you actually grew up hearing about a pre-tribulation rapture, and what you're saying is this is not something that dates back to early church history or even the Bible or even the Gospels. This is a, something that man has made. I think Left Behind is huge because, you know, I'm 30 years old, but I grew up watching Left Behind, reading all the Left Behind kids' books, and then hearing all the time in church that, you know, at any moment Jesus is going to return, that we have to be ready, which is a biblical reality in the sense that we should all be ready. And this is one thing I've always said. We might not be in the last days, but we're all in our last days. Yeah. So we're not saying tonight, and I, I think uh, just to clarify, Dr. Brown, we're not saying not to be ready for Jesus. We're not saying, we're saying, hey, you could be in your last days, and the reality is nobody's promised tomorrow that really any of us can go at any moment, right? I mean, we could right, breathe so, our last breath, breath at think, any moment. Think of this. Think of this. Everyone who's been waiting for the return of Jesus thus far has, has died without him returning, Correct. Mm, yeah, but every everyone has died, and and we all know people that died suddenly, car accident, sudden heart attack for no reason. They're, they're gone. You're here one day, and they're gone. Every single day, someone dies unexpectedly. Many many people die unexpectedly. So we know we have to be ready to meet the Lord at any moment, just because of death. That's a reality, yep. right? So that reality is enough. And I want to live in such a way as to please the Lord in my life makes sense in the light of eternity. I, I don't need an any minute rapture to give me any extra incentive for that. In fact, aside from the idea of readiness and, and not falling into sin and laziness and complacency, like, ah, he's never coming back. Aside from that, the emphasis in the New Testament is not on the when, but on the what. When he returns, what's going to happen to us when he appears, we're going to become like him. We're going to see him in the clouds, be caught up to meet him, and then together descend to earth in the sight of the whole world. I mean, it, it's a glorious thing that's going to happen in light of that, in light of the fact that he's going to come and pour out his wrath on the ungodly. How then should we live today? It's the what more than the when that gives us incentive. So good. Let's talk about the idea and the contradiction. And this is, again, this is the number one thing that I couldn't reconcile and why I'm, why we're doing this tonight and why I'm pursuing saying, hey, I want to learn about this, is that if we do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, biblically and in, an, in a real practical sense, we're preaching three comings of Christ. Would that be safe to say? Because I think about yeah. it. Jesus came as the Messiah, right? Dies. And then he comes again before the tribulation for us. And then he comes again at the end of the seven years. Because I, I, at least all the pre-trib people I know, and including myself, I've always taught, hey, the pre-trib, the tribulation uh, before it starts, God raptures up his church. And then at the end of the seven years, Jesus comes back on the white horse. You know, we come back with him in white garments, his robes dripping in blood. Ours are pure. And he comes at the battle at Armageddon. We know the whole story. Um, talk to us a little bit about this idea of three comings of Christ. If we yeah. preach, because again, there's a, there's 75% paid probably more in the audience that are pre-trib. If we preach this pre-trib, Really, we're preaching three comings of Christ. Yeah, we are. And uh, let me get into that in detail in a moment. But yeah. first, this word of background. When, when I was saved about a year, I was so hungry for the Lord that I spent at least six or seven hours alone with God every day. And I mean alone. There were no distractions then. You didn't have cell phones and, and PCs and tablets and social media and anything. I mean alone. Six wow. or seven hours alone with God every day. Three hours would be in the Word. I would read the Word two hours a day. I would memorize 20 verses a day. So by the, by the time I was saved, about two years, I had read the Bible at that point, cover to cover, about five times. I'd probably memorized 4,000 verses. If you asked me why I believed anything I believed, I was like a machine gun. Here are all the verses. Why? A friend asked me once to explain to him the difference between the rapture and the second coming and to go through Matthew 24 with him. And as I did, I realized, why well, I don't know much about this subject. That's wow. odd because I know all this other stuff really well. So because I was sure it was right, I went out and got all the pre-trib books. And I just invite people, just don't get mad at me, but think about this. Come on, go ahead. Where did you get this doctrine from? Did you get it just, you never heard it? No one ever told you about it? Just studying the word, you came to these conclusions? Or was it taught to you? Was it explained to you? So mm. I went out and got all, all the major so books, good. J. Dwight Pentecost, Things to Come, several volumes by John Walvoord. I mean, books, books that had charts of what to expect and see, all of this stuff, okay? I got all the books. I mastered the doctrine. I preached it aggressively and, as a young guy, dogmatically mm. until someone gave me a book. I was saved maybe at this point four or five years, and it, it questioned whether this was taught in church history. And I thought, wait a second, wait a second. 
out of everything I believe, this is the only thing I didn't get straight from the Bible. I got wow. reading other books. When I went back to just reading the Bible, it's like, of course, of course, there's no pre-trib rapture. So, so let me explain that. Back to your question. Yeah. The Bible uses a number of different words to describe the Lord's return. The most common one is parousia, okay? For example, 1 first, first Corinthians uh, or 1 Thessalonians, uh, the fourth chapter, it speaks of his coming, right? And that's when we're going to yeah. meet him in the air. Or, or 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that, that it speaks of his coming for us. Okay, so that's the primary word that's used. The Greek word can mean coming in the sense of an arrival or actual presence. Someone's presence can be spoken mm. of as parousia. Paul uses it a number of times, like 1 Corinthians 16, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus. Or he writes to the Philippians about his coming to them. It's an actual arrival. So wow. I'm at the airport a lot. And they'll say flight so-and-so is approaching. Okay, it's close, but it hasn't arrived yet. It's arrived when it gets on the ground and gets to the gate. Now it has mm. arrived. So that's how this is described. It's a well-known word in the ancient Greek world. All right. So wow. it is a parousia. So my first question is, if Jesus comes and, and he stops somewhere above the earth, never touches the earth, right? Has he arrived? No. Can that wow. be described as a parousia? No. Here's, here's the other thing that elsewhere it says explicitly, like in Matthew 24, after the tribulation of those days is when the parousia takes place. Or 2 Thessalonians 2, that the Lord wow. will destroy the Antichrist with his parousia, right? So here's the question. Is there a parousia before the tribulation and then a parousia after the tribulation? That would be a second coming and a third coming. That would be like saying, now, first we have the, the, the coming, and then after seven years, we have the coming. It's completely confusing when you use the same words. Yet the words that Paul uses are words like arrival. The coming of the Lord is his arrival. And, and it, Jesus tells us it will be after the tribulation of those days. Paul tells us it, was, it is then when he comes publicly, Paul speaks of his appearing, of his revelation. We will all see him. Peter says with his coming is when he's going to come with, with, with destruction. That happens after the tribulation. And Paul says explicitly in 2 Thessalonians 1, that when he comes in fire and wrath for the ungodly, that's when we're going to be rescued. So it, it, it's very clear in scripture that there's not a second coming and a third coming, or think of it like this, a coming where he doesn't actually arrive. So it's an arrival where he doesn't arrive. It's, it's an appearing where he's unseen. It's a revelation that's hidden. No, no. All mm. the words that Paul uses are speaking of a public event after the final outpouring of wrath, after the shaking judgment, this is when these things happen. And as for us here on the earth, God, God has great keeping power. I've put my trust in him. Why, sh why should we fear what Jesus tells us to expect? John 16, 33, in this world, you will have tribulation, mm -hmm. but be, of, be encouraged. I've overcome the world. And what does Paul write in Romans 8, 35, where he says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? What's the first thing on his list? Tribulation? tribulation. No, never. Why are we so yep. afraid of the tribulation? Wow, that's so good. So this idea, and I want to really just capitalize on what you said, it, this idea that if I just read the Bible, if some of you didn't catch this, if I just read the Bible and I didn't take in all these books that I've bought on the pre-trib or all these uh, YouTube videos I've watched or all these articles I've read, which I've done all those things, right? If I just open the Bible, would I come up with a pre-tribulation rapture? Would my conclusion be Jesus is going to come before the tribulation. And I think the the honest answer would be no. And this is something, you know, when we debate against those that are cessationists, or we did a yeah. video a couple weeks ago on disproving cessationism. One of my points in the video was, if you just read the Bible, you would never come up with the gifts of the Spirit are not for today. You'd never come up with he healing and deliverance is not for today because you can't, there's no place in scripture where it says they ended. There's no place where it says God has taken the gifts away or the, now that the apostles have died, now that the, the, um, the Bible has been canonized, we don't need the gifts or the apostles or the prophets anymore. And so I think this is a really valid argument because a lot of us, including me, and I'm being honest, Dr. Brown, with you tonight, have got our information from a book we read or a YouTube channel, or we, you know, we look up best pre-tribulation -tri arguments, and then we look at the scriptures and say, oh, that fits there, that goes there. But I think you have to, you have to really stretch some of these things to try to fit it in. One example is 
when I was teaching through the book of Revelation and I couldn't escape the fact that there was these martyrs throughout Revelation, right? And again, I'm just being vulnerable with all of you guys watching. I know there's 3,000 people watching, but just hear my heart. I was reading about these tribulation martyrs and these, these saints under the altar of God saying, Lord, avenge us, avenge us. When is the time? And the Lord would keep saying, now's not the time. There's more that, that need to die. There's more that needs to be done before I avenge the saints. And then of course, you know, he throws the fiery sensor down later on. But I kept thinking in my mind and I kept, making myself say as I was teaching it, you know, these are those that got saved after the the, pre, the rapture, right? These are those that got saved after the rapture. But then one day I was thinking in my head, that's not actually in the Bible. It doesn't say these are the tribulation saints after the rapture. It just says these are those that were martyred in the tribulation. So then I started thinking, how does this make sense? Because again, we're having to put our own opinion into the text and try to like say things that aren't there. And for me, I just struggled because I thought these people are getting martyred nonstop. And are these just people that got saved after? But again, that's that pre-trib mindset. So let me, let me go here really quick. Um, some would say, and I've said again, so a lot of these arguments I've used again, being transparent here, the church is not mentioned in the tribulation from revelation four to 18. And then, and obviously revelation 19 through 22, we see the church reappear or re mention. Um, and then what do you think of the idea that John being caught up represents the church being raptured? This is a big argument people make. I personally don't see it. I've never made that argument because I can't see how John taken up in the spirit represents the church. Although I've heard that argument, you sure have over and over and over in these debates. Debates. How, how do you make sense of the church not being a main theme or seen and address and address throughout um, the book of Revelation? First, the church is never a main theme. It mentions seven churches, ecclesia in Greek, seven congregations in Asia Minor. Jesus speaks to them in Revelation 2 and 3. And then in the 22nd chapter, he reiterates, I had this message for the churches. So mm -hmm. the church, in terms of the universal body of Christ, is never mentioned by that name in Revelation. That's the first thing. It's just seven congregations in Asia Minor, each one in Ecclesia. And then in Revelation 22, Jesus reiterates, I had messages for the, the, this, this book of Revelation here as for these churches. Okay? So that's, mm -hmm. that's the first thing. Second thing is, we're told that the church is now in heaven, right? Yeah. Beginning in the fourth chapter. Well, there's a lot of vision in heaven. How come it never mentions the Ecclesia there? Never, mm -hmm. never mentioned, never uses that word. If you say, see, they're not mentioned on earth. Well, they're not mentioned in heaven either. Yeah. And, true. and beginning in Revelation 19, it doesn't mention a special class of believers. In fact, elsewhere in Revelation, it talks about the servants of God, you know, the remnant that keep his commandments. Those are the believers, right? And the idea, mm -hmm. well, if God, if God really loved me, he wouldn't let me live through the tribulation. Oh, but these others, he, he doesn't love the same way. He doesn't care about the same way, the ones that he lets go through the tribulation. And our brothers and sisters that in recent years have been tortured to death and burned to death and buried alive. Does he not love them because he lets them go through that? Wow. This mentality is largely, especially a Western mentality, because we are not going through things that brothers and sisters have gone through in church history. And, and therefore, we, we have this mythical thing that we will just be spared from some of the suffering. But the way we live in America as believers is very unusual in church history. Yeah. And it's very unusual around the world in terms of where the church is really growing. Wow, that's as, really, as really for, good. Yeah, as for Revelation 4, John being caught up to heaven representing the rapture. Well, first, you have to find this rapture, right? In other words, when you actually go looking for it, it's, it's not mentioned aside from in conjunction with the public return of Jesus after the tribulation. That, that's the first thing. The second thing is, who gave you that idea? Mm. Where does the text say that? Where does the text indicate it? Where does the text say that John is a type of the church? It, it's not there. It is purely imagined and read into it to fit a certain scenario. And then others would read Revelation entirely differently, saying, look, the first application is to the first century. That has to have meaning for the first century. So let's start there. So I think we have to ask a lot of larger questions coming into this. But I'm, I'm a Bible guy. Show me. If you show me in the Bible, yeah, I'll yeah. adjust my theology. I'll change what I believe. Show me where this is a type of the church being allegedly raptured and show me the rapture somewhere. You know, I, I say yeah. it's funny. People say, but where do you put the marriage supper of the lamb? Because that's what's going to happen when we're raptured up to heaven during those seven years, the marriage supper of the lamb. So I, I was doing a, a, a live stream with one of your friends last week. And I said to him, well, give me your top three verses on the marriage supper. He had none. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's Everyone another says, thing. What? We got this, this giant doctrine about the marriage supper of the lamb. The Bible doesn't talk about that. 
explicitly. And, and if it does, it's, it would be in Isaiah 25, where there's a great feast after Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom here on the earth post-trib. That's when it takes place. Yeah, and I think the only mention of it in Revelation, if I'm not mistaken, is Revelation 19, and it gives you a couple sentences, and then it goes on to the battle at Armageddon, where you know God comes back, destroys the Antichrist, the whole thing happens, and then the birds of the air feast on the bodies of those that are destroyed at That's at the Great Armageddon. Supper. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the, the Great Supper. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Really good. So let's let's um let's go into this, right? And this is what the chat's going to continue to spam throughout the broadcast and continue to say and again guys this is good we want you to be here we want to discuss these things and we will if we have time take questions at the end so save your questions for the end we'll take some of your guys's um questions about this this is the most i guess popular i would say is god's wrath is not for christians and the tribulation is the wrath of god being poured out so where do we i, I think you already touched on this a little bit but where do we where do we draw the line of okay listen if god's wrath and again this is an argument that's always brought i've used this argument again if God's wrath is being poured out, if, you know, the Bible says the day of wrath, it's the time of wrath and all the stuff that it says, where do Christians lie in that? Is that like God pouring it out on everybody? Do Christians go through this as well? Does God protect Christians? Where do you see that argument in, in terms yeah. of the wrath of God being poured out? So first, when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 Thessalonians 5, we're not appointed to wrath, he's not talking about tribulation. That's not the big issue. By the way, Thessalonians, you won't be going through a seven-year tribulation that's going to happen more than 2,000 years from now when you've been long dead. That, that's not the issue. It means we're not going to hell. Okay. And when Jesus comes pouring out his wrath, that final day of wrath, we won't be subject to that. So that's gotcha. number one. Number two, God's wrath has been poured out through history. And God's wrath is, is being poured out in certain ways now. Uh, and God knows how to keep his people in the midst of it. Uh, Isaiah 26, God says to his people in an end time passage, come away, hide yourselves in the inner chamber in, until my wrath passes by. So mm. he knows how to keep us just like he kept the children of Israel uh, in, in Egypt. He poured out his wrath on the nation and he preserved the people of Israel. So he knows how to do that. The, the other thing is that the idea that the tribulation is all the wrath of God. Really, it's it's towards the final moments of that or the, the final period of that, that the most wrath is poured out. Like everything else, the Bible does talk about believers, God's servants on the earth at that point. It, it mentions in Revelation 9, putting a seal uh, on, yeah. on some of them to protect them. So, so God can do that. He puts a seal on it, just like in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. He protects us. He marks us. You know, Revelation 7 references this. So he knows how to keep us from his wrath. This is a theme from scripture. And you say, yeah, but it's going to be different than, oh, God's not able. Sorry. Mm. I, I didn't realize God wasn't able to protect us from his wrath. So he lovingly disciplines his people. He never pours out his wrath on his believing children. That's for a sinning, rebellious world, but he will keep us through it. And again, just look up the word flipsis in Greek. See if you can look it up in a concordance and because it'd be translated in different ways, but it means tribulation, trouble, pressure. And it occurs over 40 times in the New Testament, and it's just a regular word. And, and there are periods where it's even greater. The tribulation is even greater, more intense. Jesus says, hey, you're going to have that in this world, but be encouraged. I've overcome the world. In me, you overcome also. Nothing to fear. That's so good. And I like what you said earlier, this this American mentality that God doesn't want us to go through anything, right? You look at people, I, right now I'm doing a verse by verse in the book of Acts. So we're in, I think, chapter 17 or 18. We're going through every single verse on live stream. And they were constantly going through tribulation. I mean, they were constantly, and they would get persecuted and they would get beat and everything you could think of. And then they would say, Lord, thank you that we're found worthy of going through this tribulation, of going through these trials. They're thanking God for letting them go through tribulation, right? And this is, it's a mile, it's a mile away from the Christianity we have today in America where somebody makes fun of us on Facebook and then we're like, oh Lord, I'm being persecuted. And then you look at other believers that are watching tonight. There's people tonight watching from China. There's people watching tonight from India and they're going like, oh no, persecution's normal where we're at. It's just a Western idea. And I think it's selfish of us to have this mindset where we're too good to go through tribulation or we don't, we could never suffer the way the disciples did. I mean, if you look at the track record, all the disciples, except for, I believe, John, and then Judas obviously killed himself, they all died at the hands of persecutors. Like, God didn't deliver any of them from the hands of their persecutors. If you look at James, killed by the sword, God didn't deliver him from the tribulation. So this idea that God would deliver us, I totally agree. When you look at the context of scripture, God has a way of protecting his people, but then also 
There are people that God allows to be persecuted for the growth of and the extension of the gospel. Now, some say, well, I don't understand that. Well, there's a lot of stuff that we don't have to understand. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. And so I think that's a, you know, there's a healthy tension between persecution and trial. And I think, I don't want to say, well, I guess I could say the prosperity gospel that's been popularized in America says God would never let you suffer. God would never let you. There's people right now watching Dr. Brown. Here's the reality. They're dying of cancer right now as they watch. And we pray and we believe and we're charismatic. We believe and we've seen people get healed of cancer, but some will die of cancer. Some will go through that tribulation and God will carry them through. And we know, we all know people that have gone through the, this thing. And so I really like um, the point you made there with the tribulation that God will keep his people through the tribulation period. Um, let's talk about here the rapture and the second coming being different events. So let me just give you what I've talked about, what I've people have read, what people are even typing in the chat. They're, they're saying the rapture and the second coming, which I think you touched on this, are different events because of the rapture. One person said earlier, Jesus doesn't come back. He meets us in the air. But at the second coming, they return to earth with Jesus as a heavenly army. Um, at the rapture, believers get new bodies and go to heaven. At the second coming, glorified believers come down from heaven. At the rapture, the church, uh, at the rapture delivers the church from tribulation. The second coming, believers come down again. At the rapture, the church goes to heaven. The second coming, Jesus comes to earth. At the rapture, and it happens at any moment the second coming happens after the tribulation so again people draw these parallels before between the differences would you just explain to us with a post-tribulation mindset what does it look like in a practical sense um because it sounds like what you're saying is it's all those things but they're together they're not separate events they have they happen at the same time right but not just that the all those arguments as persuasive as they sound are absolutely unbiblical. Why? Mm. Because Paul and other New Testament writers use the exact same vocabulary for the so-called rapture and the second coming. So reread what you just read. And in fact, if you don't mind, read the first two, but yeah. instead of rapture, just use the word a second coming. Whatever they use in the second part, use in the first part and just okay. reread that. Okay. Yeah. So at the second coming, believers meet Jesus in the air. At the second coming, they return to earth with Jesus as a heavenly army. At the second coming, believers get new glorified bodies. I see where you're, I see where you're going here and go to heaven. At the second coming, glorified believers come down from right, heaven. So to that's earth. that's that's Paul's vocabulary. Okay. That's Paul's exact vocabulary. So for example, First Thessalonians four, which is the classic passage about we'll meet the Lord in the air, right? He uses the word the coming, the parousia. He doesn't use a word for rapture there. Mm. He uses the word for the, the coming, which is an actual arrival, right? So problem number one is if you taught it using biblical vocabulary, it would be complete nonsense. First, we have mm. the second coming. Then we have the second coming. The second coming is a secret event. The second coming is a public event. It would be complete and other nonsense. Be like, what in the world are, are you talking about? That's, that's the first problem there. The, the second problem, again, is if it's not an arrival, if it's an actual coming, he stops in heaven or, or, or somewhere above the earth, then you can't call it a coming. You can't call it a revival, a, a, an arrival. Also, wow. if it is a secret event, a hidden event, why is it described elsewhere in the New Testament as his appearing, his epiphania, where we long for 2 Timothy 4, we long for his appearing, not for a secret mm. event, but for his appearing, which Matthew 24, Jesus says, his appearing to be seen by all will be after the tribulation. We are waiting for his appearing or the apocalypsis in Greek, which is his revealing. So that's the second problem. The third issue is, is simply this. When, when Paul says, we'll meet the Lord in the air, the Greek word he uses for meet is commonly used for the crowd that would go out to meet, say, the emperor or the royal dignitary as he came near the city. They would meet him and escort him back. Isn't wow. it a little bit bizarre? Say that, that one more time. Say that one more time. Yeah. So, so the, the the word used for meeting there in First Thessalonians four is commonly used in the ancient Greek world for when the crowd would go out to meet the the royal dignitary who was coming in, making his parousia in their city. They would go out to meet him and escort him back. The wow. idea that Jesus comes all the way down, stops, right, catches us up secretly. Whereas the Bible is explicit, this is going to be a public event for the world to see, catches it up explicitly and then turns back to heaven. Where does it ever talk about him returning? Show me one verse where it says he's going to come almost here and then return back. No, never mentions that at all. Instead, he appears for the whole world to see his glorious appearing, Titus 2, yes? 
his glorious wow. appearing. We are now caught up to meet him. The dead Messiah rise first. We who are alive and remain are caught up to meet him, given our glorified bodies. And now, as part of his army, we descend to earth with him as he pours out his wrath on on a sinning world. And the whole world, the world that was hating us and persecuting us, sees it happen. That's glorious. That's powerful. That's a hope. And and it's exactly what scripture says. The events take place at one and the same time. As for the idea that, quote, the rapture could happen in any moment, just a question. You know, when when Peter was told by Jesus that he was going to die an old man and be crucified, Wasn't that telling Peter that Jesus was not returning any moment? When Jesus gave the Great Commission and start here and go here and go here, before the disciples had even gotten out of Jerusalem, do you think they thought that Jesus could come any minute? Mm. In fact, what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5 is is that he says that for, for those who are asleep, he's coming as a thief in the night. But for you as believers, You'll know the times Jesus says in Luke 21, when you see these things happening, look up for your redemption draws near. Your redemption draws near. We don't know the day or the hour, but we should know the season. We should know the times. There there are things that scripture speaks of that have to happen before the Lord returns. Let's say that you were a a pre-tribber and you believed that Israel had to be restored back to the land before Jesus returned. Well, if that hadn't happened yet, you could know, okay, there's still time. So again, God can accelerate the pace and things that we expect to take a hundred years could take five years. And we live in readiness to, to meet the Lord because any of us could die at any moment. But the idea of this, any second rapture, it's an unhealthy way to live. It, it robs us of long-term vision and it's actually not taught in the Bible. So good. I know there's a lot of people that are getting shook up. Listen, I know you guys are saying, Isaiah, you're being converted. Isaiah, you're changing. I am. I'm listening. I'm receiving and I'm going, wow, this is, he's given us Bible here. He's given us actual, not what a book says, not what a YouTube video says, not what an article says, you know, on Relevant Magazine. He's given us actual Bible and Bible facts. So it's it's hard. And I, I told you earlier, you did a debate that I watched, I think the first 20 or 30 minutes of, and I was like feeling bad for the, the I won't mention who you debated, but I felt bad for the guy you debated because I thought in my head, how could you argue this? Like what argument, you know, it almost feels foolish even bringing you some of these arguments, but it's like, what argument can you bring once you've received the truth? And some of you, I would just challenge to humble yourself and say, man, maybe I was wrong about this. It's a healthy thing to say, I was wrong about something and then change. That's like repentance. I was wrong. I'm going to change. And so, yeah, I'm definitely being enlightened. God is opening my eyes and I'm loving everything that you're saying. I want to just touch on this idea of a suddenly, um, you said something where, cause people in the, people are going to say, push back and say, well, the Bible says no one's going to know the day or hour, but what people don't recognize, and you mentioned this, is the Bible actually says we will know the season of the Lord's return. Jesus said when you see the branches changing, the buds changing, just like you know summer's coming, then you know the Son of Man is getting ready to come. So um, we will know the season or the time, so that would line up with the post-tribulation rapture because we're not going to know the exact day of, you know, this is the start of the seven years, this is the last day, but we right. will be, to some extent, have an idea of, okay, we're in the season of the time where the Lord can come back at any moment. So it doesn't contradict. I, I hope I'm representing you right. It doesn't yeah. contradict what Jesus says. It actually explains better what Jesus said, because Jesus said, we're going to know the season, um, which if you guys don't know, a season's only a few months. So it's not like a season's a, a year. A season represents just several months. So Jesus is saying, you're going to actually know the approximate time. Let me also read one verse here that you talked about that I think is very telling that this week I've been looking into. And I was like, wow, I didn't see this in full light before, but let me just read this first Thessalonians five. And I'm just going to read it in its full context. Um, but concerning and everybody, please, again, I'm being converted here, but everybody that's preacher, just listen, uh, first Corinthians, uh, first Thessalonians five, one, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord. So comes as a thief in the night. So Paul is saying, you know, it comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But here's where I want to key on here, because I've used this verse, now I'm realizing out of context, because here's what verse 4 says. Everybody listen. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. I mean, this is the revelation, guys. (laughs) If you read this, you're going, what? For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or nor of darkness. Therefore... 
Let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober for those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But those who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate. Okay. And he goes on and on, but interesting here, which I've never heard any pre-tribber preach this. I've never preached it as being someone that was pre-trib. Okay. I'm going to use past tense verbiage here, but where he says in verse four, but you brethren are not in darkness. So it will be a surprise to the world, but you're not in darkness and it won't overtake you. And this is what it says, or it shouldn't overtake you if you're not sleeping. It shouldn't overtake you as a thief for your sons. Um, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. Talk to us a little bit about that there. Cause I think that's a, you know, that's a, um, that's a game changer there. When you realize, yeah. wait a minute, Paul says it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Again, Jesus gives us signs by which we can know that our redemption is, is drawing near. That's one thing. Uh, here and elsewhere in the New Testament, the threat of Jesus coming as a thief in the night is a threat of judgment for those asleep. Mm. It, it's, it's a threat for the world or, or for believers who've fallen asleep. He comes as a thief in the night. But if we are children of the light, then we don't live in the night spiritually. We always live in the light. And therefore, that day will not overtake us as a thief. So why do we take the thief in the night passages, which are, are warnings to the non-believer or warnings wow. to, the, to the sleeping saints, and now apply that to our own theology for ourselves? It's a bizarre thing. And, and you know, the, the inconsistency of things always strikes me. For example, people say, what about Revelation 3.10? And Jesus tells the church in Philadelphia that, that he's going to keep them from the hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. And, 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 and they say, and, and the, the churches in Revelation, that represents seven church ages. So I ask, well, first, where does it say they're church ages? Nowhere mm. does the text tell us that. And I'd never dream of it, reading it any more than 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Et Those are church ages, right? I mean, where does it say that? It doesn't. But even if they were church ages, and even if we were in the, the last church age now, that would be Laodicea, which is after Philadelphia. So that promise, wow. even with the church age theory, would have been several hundred years ago. And then based on the New Testament itself, it was written to a church in that day. It must have had relevance to them. But the most profound thing is that the, the Greek phrase there, to keep from, tera, uh, with, with the, the Greek uh, verb tereo, to, to, to keep, to guard, and the preposition from, that only occurs two times in the entire New Testament, to keep from. Revelation 3.10 and John 17, 15. Let me read it to you. Jesus says, my prayer, Father, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Wow. So the only other time that this is used, and it's used here before Revelation, Jesus is saying, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but rather to keep them from the evil one. God knows how to keep us from his wrath, in this world from the evil one from the hour of trouble he knows how to keep us from those things right here in this world and his prayer is not that god would take us out of the world it's never been his prayer one of wow. my friends says the goal is not to get the church out of the world but to get the the the, the church into the world to, to get the what's in the church into the lost into this world so good dr brown why do you think people still zealously get so angry do you think that pre-trib is a sacred cow in the church. I mean, to me, again, if I'm wrong, I'm like, humble myself. Let's, let's, let's go, let's go with what the Bible says, not with what I think or what a book thinks. Why is there such an anger towards anybody that resists a pre-tribulation doctrine? Why do people get so zealously angry? Do you think it's a sacred cow in the church? Yeah. I mean, we, we can all do that with certain doctrines that are important to us, right? You might be a Calvinist or a Minionist or a cessationist or a continuationist or you know, different views, and we can be very passionate about that. But it strikes me as, as odd that it's often so passionate here when, when the book that Craig Keener and I wrote, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, which is in the link there. Which I'm going to read this it. week. I'm going to read that book this week. Okay, so guys, awesome. it's down below in the description. Yeah. So the book we co-authored, and we both came out of, of pre-trib teaching. That's what we learned when we were first saved. And we assumed the church leaders knew better than we do. So we better learn it. You know, that's that was our men mentality. Then the more we read the word, the more we realized it, it wasn't there. But the book is written in a gracious spirit. Again, some of the finest Christians I know on the planet are pre-tribbers. They love the Lord. They're serving God. We can work side by side without any problem or any issue. But when I see people getting so angry or calling me a heretic, I mean, think of this, this, 
this is not even a salvation yeah. issue to yeah. start. And then was unknown in terms of this whole systematized doctrine until the 1830s and thereafter. So to, to, that's basically you're calling all the church in history up until then, and much of the church around the world to this day, heretical. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre Can thing. Can you say that again? You're saying that this high idea of the pre-trib, which a lot of people are angry about, didn't even start until you said the 1830s? It, didn't, it wasn't even around? Yeah, yeah, in terms of any type of systematized teaching on this or clear teaching, and there's okay. not a single major church leader uh, who taught anything near this. Uh, you know, you'll read a select quote, but then when you read, you, you got to read the whole quote. You got to see what the whole book says, and you realize, ah, uh, it's being pulled out of context because people say, no, no, go to this. It'll show the church fathers supported pre-trib. Trust me. Church historians will tell you other, when you actually look in the full quote or look at the full context, like, oh, that was taken out of context. Mm. But look, but you're basically calling, I mean, from John Wesley to Charles Spurgeon to, you know, some of the finest saints on the planet that you're calling them all heretics. So I, it doesn't bother me. I just feel bad for people. Yeah. Why? get so emotional about it. That's the first thing I challenge someone. If God says something in his word and someone doesn't hold to it, you feel bad for them, but you don't get all emotional over it. You know, mm -hmm. I have Calvinist friends and we can debate back and forth Calvinism, Arminianism. It's a good debate because we each have scriptures on different sides and things. And I understand why they hold to my, that their view. They understand why I hold to mine. And we have fellowship in Jesus, you know, in, in the midst of our differences. So I don't know why people get so passionate, except that it has become a sacred cow. There's almost an emotional attachment to it. And this idea of we, we get saved from the tribulation. If we don't get saved from the tribulation, it's not the gospel. God doesn't love me. I mean, I've had people tell me that with tears. I'm not, I'm not trying to mock or yeah, be condescending. Yeah. God, God forbid, I honor my, my pre-trib friends and fellow leaders. I honor them in the Lord and, and, and other scholars. I honor them in the Lord. But when I see people get so emotional, something's wrong there. You know, there, there was there was a, a cowboy preacher in England. This was his whole getup. I mean, he'd wear this cowboy out and talk with a heavy, you know, cowboy kind of Texas accent and, and was preaching on the resurrection. So just his out the boots and the, the cowboy, hat, you know, it, it got attention, the leather jacket. He's preaching on the resurrection of Jesus and an atheist starts screaming. I mean, his face is vibrating. Jesus did not rise from the dead. And the guy said, then why are you so angry? Mm. You know, so I would just ask, if you're really ticked at me, or it's like, how dare Isaiah bring this guy? I'm, I'm, I'm unsubscribing for everybody here. Just, just to ask yourself, why are you so angry? Because if I was wrong on this after holding to it the last 45 years, I'd be embarrassed by being wrong as a teacher in the body. I, I'd re-examine how could I be so wrong? But I'm going to be angry at you for sharing a differing mm. view. So if there is this emotional reaction Ask yourself why, and then just do what I do. Lord, whatever your word says, I want to embrace. Whatever your truth is, I want to follow. That's so good. And I've come to find anytime I don't agree with the Bible, I'm always wrong. The Bible's never yes, wrong sir. when I read it and say, oh, wait, that, that doesn't make sense to my pre-trib doctrine or whatever it is I'm preaching. And then I go, oh, I think I might be the wrong one. I don't think I've ever come to a place where the Bible's wrong. So again, I think it takes humility from many of you um, that are being enlightened tonight to what the Bible says. And you know, Dr. Brown, I don't want to ever undervalue, which this needs to be said. And there's, you know, almost 4,000 people watching. You are incredibly um, educated in the Bible more than I would safely say anybody that's probably watching that's that's debating or arguing tonight. So that's valuable. We don't just say, well, you know, and some of you, listen, you've been saved a year and you're acting like you knew Jesus personally when, you know, you're his cousin in, in the, the Matthew. So for me, I'm thinking I've been saved 11 years. You know, you've been studying this stuff way longer than I've probably even been alive. And so I think we have to also realize, man, there's a level of, of um, study, of research, of scholarly work that you've done that is trustworthy, that is trustworthy, that you're not just shooting in the dark here saying this is what I think the Bible says. Like you're, you guys, you're talking about years and years and years of studying, of research, of course, all the prayer and fasting, all the spiritual side, I'm, I'm not even talking about that. I'm just saying I wanna also put, make sure that we don't ever undervalue that. Cause I think in the church we think, oh, well, I believe this, they believe that, but it's like, man, let's take into consideration 
the study, the um, the all the time that's been put in to teach and train. Um, what are some of the dangers of believing in a pre-trib rapture in a practical sense? Those that say, hey, I'm hanging on and pre-trib. Again, guys, let us just remind you, I know there's new people jumping on throughout this entire broadcast. This is not a salvation issue. This is a secondary issue. You're not going to he hell because you're pre-trib. Um, you're not going to hell because you're post-trib. This is not something to divide over. This is not something to unsubscribe over. This is not something to not listen to a teacher over. So because so-and-so's pre-trib and I'm post-trib, I'm not going to cancel them and say, I can't listen to none of their teachings because I'm post-trib and they're pre. Um, we're definitely not doing that, but I think there is a, a line drawn in the sand of what does the Bible clearly say? What are some of the dangers, Dr. Brown, that you might say practically of believing a pre-trib rapture? So one is what happened to, to Christians in China who were taught a pre-trib rapture before Chairman Mao came to power and the Iron Curtain, excuse me, the Bamboo Curtain went up and they were told before things get really bad, they'll be taken out. And, and of course, that, that didn't happen. Hang on, just got to turn this no alarm worries. off. No problem. Uh, that, di that didn't happen. And Corey Ten Boom said that when the missionaries came back, many of the Christians were very upset with them. As you told wow. us we'd be raptured out before trouble and hardship came. You say, oh, no, no, no. But it's before the wrath of God is poured. You make that distinction. It's like, hey, we, we suffered horrifically. We went through all kinds of tribulation. Don't, don't tell us we didn't go through that. So there can be a false expectation that you will not go through certain suffering. I actually heard a sermon in March of, of 2020 at a, a major church in America, well-known church in America, and it was just done by internet because the building cannot have people in it because of COVID, explaining, don't worry, this is not going to get really bad. And there's no way there could be a real plague Otherwise, God would rapture us out first. Mm. So this is saying we're not even going to have a really bad bout of COVID because God would rapture us out first. So there's that, that mentality. The, the, the fellow said, look, excuse me of being an escapist, but I'm a biblical escapist because Jesus said, pray you can escape all the things that are coming. You can escape things and go right through them You know, at, at the same time as Jesus speaks of us doing it elsewhere. The, the other mentality is, is not just the false expectation and the being disappointed when we do go through tribulation hardship and final days of tribulation. But the other thing is there's a theology that says, and it's, it's not always there with pre-trib teaching, but normally is that things will only get worse before Jesus returns, that everything is going to degenerate before he returns. So why bother trying to change the culture? Why bother getting engaged in the school system, you know, with what your kids are learning, because things are only going to get worse. It is a theology of pessimism that is very unhelpful, very unhealthy. And even if it was true that at some point things will only go down, maybe that's 100 years from now or 50 years from now. What if people thought that through history, there'd never be any kind of change? So that's the second thing. The third thing is this mentality of he could come any minute, he could come any minute, he could come any minute can play on us in such a way that we don't plan and think in a long-term way, that we're not asking, okay, what kind of world are my great-grandkids going to live in? Because that's the reality, wow. that, that that's happened to everybody else so far, you know, in previous generations, that they're, they're future descendants. Or why should I go to medical school and spend all these years to, to get a, a, a doctor's uh, license and then serve so I could be a medical missionary because people are just dying. I need to tell them about Jesus because he's coming any minute. So the ability to think in a multi-generational way or to plan long-term is, is often robbed by this any minute, any minute mentality. I know that's how I thought when I was first saved. And I remember pulling up to our church building on a Sunday morning when we had shifted the clocks, you know, that in the fall or spring, we yeah, shifted yeah. the clocks. And I showed up an hour early Oh no! and nobody was there. And I thought, oh no, I, I, I missed the rapture. So this is the way some people live. It's unhealthy. It's unbiblical. Wow. So good, man. You're just, you're just breaking stuff in my mind. I love it. I love it. It's really good stuff. Um, uh, guys, if you want to ask a question, Dr. Brown was generous enough to say he'll stay on a little bit extra tonight to answer some questions. So if you're going to ask a question, you can go ahead and do that now. Make sure you hit capital Q period, then ask your question. Please keep it concise. If you're just jumping on and we don't answer your questions, probably because we already answered it. So we're not going to keep rehashing the same questions over and over. But if you do have a question about this, feel free to put Q period, and be concise. Do not write your whole life story, please. Don't give us your prophetic song in the question. Just ask your question, and then we'll go on. But I wanted to ask you this, a personal question. 
Dr. Brown, what are your thoughts on the last days? Do you think we're in the last days? Do you see, for example, what's going on in Ukraine? When you see these world events, do you see them as signs that we're in labor pains, that we're approaching? You know, as the Bible says that the earth is in labor for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed groaning. What are your thoughts on some of these world events that happen? All right. First, the New Testament is clear that since the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been in the last days. Mm. And, and remember when, when Peter's preaching in Acts, the second chapter, and he quotes from Joel, in Joel, it just says, after this, I will pour out my spirit. But Peter adds words in that are not there in the Hebrew. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. So the last days outpouring began 2000 years ago. And throughout the New Testament, it's spoken of the end of the age, or 1 John 2, the last hour. So we've been in the last days for 2,000 years and always live with that holy tension of being in this world and yet not of it, and knowing that the judge is at the door, you know, marching in parallel history and will break in suddenly. So that's one thing. The second thing is, when I got saved in 71, it was all worked out. We knew Jesus was coming very, very soon because all the signs were at hand and everything had fallen into place. And mm. surely the end was near. So again, that was 71. Now, I'm not a skeptic. I, when I do my prayer retreats on a monthly basis, my heart is consumed with wanting to see Jesus return in my lifetime. My heart is consumed with, with wanting to see everything that God says has to happen, happen before I die. I mean, I, I burn with that. I travail for, for greater fruit and greater effectiveness to, to see these things happen. But from what I can see, when you've got more than 2 billion people who've never even heard the name of Jesus, wow. they don't, they don't, it's not they don't know the story, they don't even know him. He's a non-existent figure to them. I realize there, there's much more to be done still with the Great Commission. When I look at the horrific things taking place in Ukraine, I mean, it's grievous, it's, it's horrific and, and, and shocking, but is it a fraction of what happened in, in World War II? Or, or a fraction of, of the loss of life under Stalin or under Mao? Or, you know, you look at COVID, but is it a fraction of what happened, say, with the Spanish flu or with the Black Plague? So these are painful things, and each of them could be a, a, another birth pang, another contraction along the way. But I really don't know. I, I live with, because the Word of God does not give me enough information to be able to set times and dates. And everyone I know that sets times and dates thus far has been wrong. <laughs> that much I know. Look, I was around when the book 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Out in 1988 became a bestseller, hundreds of thousands of copies sold and given away. And, and, and Jesus is going to be coming back on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year Feast of Trumpets, September 12th of 1988. And people were going to, they were spending all this money because they're going to leave their debts to the Antichrist. And someone said to me, Mike, you're going to read that. I said on September 13th. I knew it wasn't going to happen. I knew that the thing was bogus. Sure enough, the next year he comes out with the second addiction, 89 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1989. So wow. Isaiah, to be totally candid, especially when I'm around other prophetic brothers and they want to know, what are you sensing? What are you seeing? There's this temptation to want to say, oh yeah, this is unfolding. That's unfolding. But better to say, Jesus said, there are going to be wars, rumors of wars. There are going to be famines, earthquakes, but, that, but the end is not yet. Really, really good stuff. Um, one person asked in the chat, of all your debating and talking, what are what is the most compelling preacher argument that you feel like you've heard that someone has made? I haven't. I, I was going to say. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm say. not being demeaning, insulting. I, I, I don't want to come across. I'm just being honest. Uh, now, if I've debated a Calvinist, you know, so obviously Romans 9, strong passage there, and we have our answers. Or if I've, if I've debated a rabbi, strong objections. But the same thing with cessationism. If I'm yeah. just going by scripture, there's no scriptural argument against the, the, con the continuation of, of the gifts that, that Paul speaks of, et cetera, in the New Testament. So honestly, I haven't, I I've listened carefully. I, I find it very, very beautiful the way it's taught and laid out and things like that. But honestly, and again, I don't mean it in an insulting way. There's no argument that comes to mind. It's like, oh, that's a tough one. I got to think about that. 
So good. Uh, so people, I don't know why this question's come like 15 times. You already addressed this. People must have missed it. Um, they said, can you please address, and this is like the only question I keep seeing with this verse, Revelation 3.10, which is, um, Revelation 3.10 says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to, the, to test the inhabitants of the earth. Dr. Michael Brown, you want to just retouch on that? I know you already yes. did, but you go to retouch on it. Number one, that was a promise that Jesus gave to the church in Philadelphia in the first century. So what did it mean to them? If the only application is at the end of the age, you get raptured before the tribulation, then the verse has absolutely no meaning to the church back then. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing to work out. And when you figure that out, then you'll figure out that God kept them on the earth as there was worldwide trial testing, you know, whatever the, the circumstance was, and he kept them in the midst of it. More importantly, more importantly, even if we just take it as an abstract verse, has no nothing to do with its original context, nothing to do with the church that Jesus says it's for, right? And it's just for the believers in, in the last generation that get raptured. The, the words keep from or protect from in Greek occur only one other time in the New Testament. That is in John 17, 15, where Jesus says to his father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. This is mm. Jesus saying, Father, don't take them out of the world, but rather keep them from the evil one. Keep them from the exact same words in the Greek. Only occur one other time. Let Jesus tell us what they mean. So right here, without taking us out of this world, God will keep us from the hour of trial that affects everyone else. Very simple. So good. So all you that keep putting Revelation 3.10, there's your answer there. Um, what do you make of, you know what, I'm not even going to ask this because I want to stay on topic. Guys, this is not a question on the whole book of Revelation. Um, this is just specifically on pre-trib and post-trib. So I'm going to stay away from the questions of the 144,000 and these different things because we could do another video on the book of Revelation. Um, what about the mid-trib doctrine? Is that something you've seen that's prevalent? A lot of people have asked about that. Um, is there an argument for that? I have To be personal, I've never even looked into a, a mid-trib. I think it's pretty uncommon. In. What are your thoughts on yeah. a mid trip? Well, doctrine? it breaks down the same way. Do you have a second coming and a third coming? It, it breaks down the same way that you have all these words speaking about a public event that the whole world will see. And, and it, by the way, it's an event that makes noise too. What does it say in First mm. Thessalonians 4? That he will come what with the blast of the trumpet, yep. the yep. shout of the archangel, and the blast of the trumpet. What does it say in, Re in, in Revelation 11? that when the seventh of seven trumpets is sounded, that's when it will be announced the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 15? That when we are instantly changed, right? Caught up to meet him, which I believe it, right? Instantly yep. changed, 1 Corinthians 15. When will that happen? The last trumpet, correct? Mm. What does it say in Matthew 24? After the tribulation of those days, the sign of the son of man's coming will appear and he will come with a loud yep. trumpet. Trumpet. Isn't that interesting that mm. you have a last trumpet that nobody hears before the before the tribulation, followed by another trumpet seven years after the last trumpet? Perhaps they are the same trumpet. So uh, again, these are things. Trust me, Isaiah. When I was zealously pre-trib, I explained how the last trumpet here was different than the, the the seventh trumpet here. The seventh of seven was different than the last here. And then people say, "No, no, no. It it has to do with with Jewish ceremony, and it's the last trumpet blast of that day." Or, or you know, no one knows the day or the hour. That's Jewish ceremony. Listen, I don't want to pull rank here, but but I believe I've studied Jewish literature and interacted more with rabbis than everyone in the chat combined. Yeah. And there are no such references in the Jewish literature. Not only have I scoured the volumes and, and scoured the concordances, I've talked to the most learned rabbis I know. And like, what are you talking about? There's no such reference there. So forget, you know, the really Jewish good. tradition backing up the pre-trib rapture. That's another myth. Really good. Somebody said, and a few people, I'm only going to take guys common ones. So if you're asking a one-off question, again, only on topic, we're not going off topic, just stay, we're going to stay on topic. Someone said, what do you make of Luke 17, 26 through 30, which I'll read it because obviously, you know, I'm not expecting you to have it memorized. Um, it says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the son of man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, giving into marriage up until Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. Verse 28. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It'll be just like this on the day the Son of Man is being revealed. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so first, uh, Noah didn't leave the earth 
and Lot didn't leave the earth, right? That's good. The wrath was poured out and they were protected. Which so, is what you said earlier. You said it, it, God exactly. will protect us. That, that's one thing. The other thing is, even if you want to argue that, that it is talking about catching us up then, okay, fine. We are caught up and descend with him as he comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who don't know God. So that final destruction, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, how many years was the tribulation of Sodom and Gomorrah? It wasn't. It was a one-time yeah. outpouring of wrath, right? How many years was the flood? It wasn't. It, it was something that lasted a, a period of months in terms of the flood, and then, or even the flood itself was just a period of weeks, right? So in, in each place, God protects his people right in the midst of what's going on. The, Noah and the ark, they were protected in the flood. The flood happened. They were in the flood, but they just were in an ark. They weren't taken off the earth. And the same with Lot. They just went to a neighboring city. But even if you want to argue, we have to be taken out first. We are caught up to meet him and we descend with him. Remember, the meeting in the air is the meeting where we go and escort him back to the earth in our transformed bodies as he pours out judgment on a sinning world. Really good. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, for taking these questions. Do you mind if I throw a couple more at you? I Go want to for respect, it. Okay, I want to respect your time as well. Um, a couple people have left this comment, the restrainer removed argument. I don't know if you're familiar with that argument. Of, yeah, of uh, course. Okay, so they're saying, what are your thoughts on that if the restrainer is removed? Um, and then, again, go ahead. We'll just, just touch on that. Right, so let's first look in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, okay? okay. And, and let's first just take a look at what Paul says there. Concerning the coming, not rapture, right? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are being gathered to him. So everyone would say, well, that must describe the rapture because we're being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become uh, easily unsettled uh, or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or what word of mouth or letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion, the apostasy, occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So he's saying that our being gathered to, to the Lord and his coming will not happen until the rebellion, which by the way means rebellion in Greek. It does not mean secret rapture. Don't let anyone throw that on you. Okay. So until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So first Paul's explicitly saying his coming and when we're gathered to meet him will not happen until there is this final apostasy and the antichrist is revealed. All right, he'll, he'll oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or worships, that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. So there's an it, what is holding him back, and a who that is holding him back. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Got it? So mm. the coming, same, same Paul writing in the same verses to the same people, talking about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. And he said, that won't happen until the Antichrist is revealed. We'll be gathered together uh, after that time to meet the Lord, and he's going to come and destroy the Antichrist. So Paul's using the, the word coming here very clearly, referring to this one event when we're caught up to meet him. All right, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is the idea that the, the, the church is taken out of the way and with the church, the Holy Spirit, and that's what's restraining the Antichrist. Well, then how is it that all these multitudes get saved yeah. in the tribulation without the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Where that's in the really world good. did we get a doctrine like that from. In our book, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, Craig Keener points out that there are over 30 different interpretations among New Testament scholars as to, as to the what and the who. But a good argument can be that the what has to do with governmental authority and the who with a strong earthly leader, when they are taken out of the way, now the man of lawlessness can, can, can arise. And the reason Paul doesn't mention it specifically like that is because Roman authorities might have thought that he was talking about overthrowing the Roman Empire or getting rid of, of Roman leadership, and hence it could have been misunderstood. That's why he just talks about it the way that he does. But what we know is it can't be the church because Paul's told us here that we won't be gathered to him until after the man of lawlessness is revealed. And at the time of Jesus coming, he will then destroy the Antichrist and we will be gathered to meet him. And we know it can't be the Holy Spirit because no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit. So whoever the restrainer is, whatever the restrainer is, is a subject of debate. 
But I think a good argument can be made in terms of, of legal government and authority, law, and, and then a strong leader. You take those out of the way. What do you get? Lawlessness. So good. Um, a couple people have asked Matthew 24, 40, which I think you talked about earlier. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. And let me just say something. And you don't have to even maybe you've already said, hey, we've already talked about this. Guys, Dr. Brown is not saying there will not be a taking away as, as we talk about the rapture. What he's saying is the timeline is not going to be before the tribulation. So there will still be a taking away where we meet Christ in the air. We're not debating the, the rapture happening, but we will return with Christ in the air. Would that match up, Dr. Brown, with um, this verse in Matthew? Because uh, I don't think it contradicts it, right? Matthew 24, 40, where if, two men. If, if I read it like that, then I would say, yeah, it's not contradicting. But I don't think that's what he's saying. It's taken in judgment. One okay. is taken in judgment and the other is left. What does it say in Matthew 13, 40? As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace. They'll be weeping and gnash your teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever is here, let, let them hear. Whoever is here, let them hear. I could go either way in terms of the meaning. And like you say, we, we will be caught up to meet him. Absolutely. And we'll descend together. Remember, we meet him and escort him to earth for his arrival, for his coming. But it could well be in Matthew 24, as, as many scholars believe, he's talking about one will be taken, namely in judgment, and, and the, the other will remain here. So he returns and, and with us and all of the ungodly, they're the ones that are now taken away and destroyed. Gotcha. Okay. Really, really good. Um, we're, again, this is off topic. I'm not going to answer this one. We talked about mid-trib. Um, the elders in Revelation, I've been taught that those represent the church. Don't the elders represent the church in Revelation when they're before the throne? Who told you that? I th no, no, someone asked that they wrote that. They no, no, no. Been... That's my question. Oh, oh gotcha, gotcha. I told you. Well, it says there are 24 that represents the church and that represents Israel. Well, first thing, fine. Let the 24 represent the church and represent Israel. Fine, J just like the New Jerusalem, you've got the foundations of the, the names of the apostles and the gates of the names of the tribes of Israel. Let them represent anything. But where does it say it represents a pre-trib rapture or the church in heaven? It doesn't. But the other the bigger question is, who told you? <laughs> what That's Bible good. verse told you what the 24 represents? Yeah, and I think, too, when we get you know into revelatory preaching, we could make the text say something it doesn't say, and yeah. we could say this represents that, and we speak it as if it's authoritative, and we're speaking canon now, and it's not. It's it's our revelation, but it doesn't mean it has authoritative power like Scripture does. Um, so, and and then let me also say this: I think people are confused about this as well. We're aware, and Dr. Brown has said this throughout the broadcast. There are Christians in heaven right now. So the, there are people from the church right now, this church age currently, you know, maybe your uncle died last week that is a part of your church that's currently in heaven. So there is a ecclesia that was from the earth that is in heaven. No one's debating that, but it doesn't mean that's the church that's been raptured, right? Is that is that safe exactly. to say there? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Awesome. Someone said, well, how, how should we plan our lives now if the post-trib is real and we will enter the tribulation? Are we entering the tribulation or are these just birth pains currently? So is there something we should be doing to plan? You know, a lot of people obviously are were pre-trib and an hour later now they're post-trib. Is there any change they should make or do we keep yeah, living yeah. how get we rid of Get rid of the big emphasis on the tribulation or the great tribulation and put the emphasis on tribulation that occurs over and over in the New Testament that Jesus and Paul tell us to expect and tell us that we'll have tribulation in this world, that in Jesus we overcome it, that we will grow in the midst of it, that our character can be strengthened. Don't think, put all this into this, this one period, the seven year tribulation or the three and a half year great tribulation, whatever it is. We don't, we don't know that we'll be alive during this time. It could be 50 or 100 years off or 200 years off or, or three years off. We don't know that. But what we do know is what Jesus said. In this world, you will have tribulation. John 16, 33. But be encouraged, I've overcome the world. Paul, Acts 14, 22. We must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. Romans 5, 3. We grow through tribulation. These are verses I quoted before. Romans 8, 35. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No, no. So put your emphasis 
where it belongs. Here, here, look at it like this. If I knew there was a possibility, and it, it might be in terms of everyone that's lived so far, one in, in 50, million, 50 or 20 trillion people, right? There is the possibility that, that a car is going to come down this particular road and drive me to a particular place, right? There's that possibility. Yeah. However, I can walk it in, in 20 minutes. Well, I'm going to walk. <laughs> in, yeah. in other words, what I do know is what's happened to every other human being in history thus far, that there are hard times in this world, that there's satanic attack, that there are people who hate us, that we may be rejected or even killed for the gospel. So be it. We're overcomers. Let's bear much fruit. Let's make a difference. And here's the way I live. You said earlier, it may not be the last days, but these are our last days. So that's how I live. I've got one life only. Yeah. One life to repay my debt of gratitude to Jesus. One, one life to make an impact. One life to, to rescue people from, from perishing. One, one life to glorify the Lord to the max in this world. So that gives me tremendous urgency every single day of my life. And, and look, I'm 67 now. I feel great, vibrant, healthy by God's grace, but I don't know how much time I have. Even if I live to be 90 something, you know, the, the clock is ticking. So here's how I live my life. I want to see the Lord return in my lifetime, but I give a substantial part of my life to pouring into the next generation. Good. I've been teaching in ministry schools now, go, basically going on 40 years, wow. pouring in and continue to do it to equip the next generation. So think of it like this. We're in a relay race, right? We're in a relay race yep. and, and it's, it's, a, it's a four by 400. You're running 400 meters. Okay. So, you know, four by 400, exactly where you are. What if it's a, a, an X by 400? You don't know how many legs there are. You run your 400 meters the best you know how. That's good. The fastest you know how. Now, here's my goal. When I reach the end, I want to give the baton to Jesus. That's and good. that's the end. And he returns. But it may not happen. Either. Then I'm going to hand it to you. And then you're going to hand it to your kids. And it could be five more generations. But either way, I'm running the same way. So we must have a multi-generational mentality because scripture calls us to, to teach our children in the coming generations about who God is. And it's been a failure of many, sadly, many Christians have gotten so uninvolved because, hey, it's only going downhill from here, that now our kids are being raised in, in a horrific mess, which leads me, before I go, I want to remind everyone or tell you for the first time, this, this coming Thursday, April 14th, is our first ever national not ashamed of Jesus day. Come on. We live in a culture that's trying to silence us, marginalize us, demonize us, cancel us. All right. And the best thing we can do is shout out all the more. We're here. We love Jesus. We love you. And we're not ashamed. Why 414? I felt the Lord drop this in my heart. Let it be tested. I felt the Lord drop this in my heart. Esther 414, where Mordecai says to Esther, who knows if you came into the kingdom for I such a time as this. And, and some believers have been kind of under the radar. Well, on this day, wear something or bring something to work or school with you or post something that says, hey, we love Jesus. We love you. We're not ashamed. Others have always been doing this. But on this day, look for another opportunity to reach someone. Pray for an open door or a divine appointment. And then maybe you'll find out all these other coworkers are believers too or your boss, or this one, or that one. It is our way to push back against cancel culture. Everyone go to notashamedofjesus.org. I know we threw a bunch of links yep, at you Yep, there's tonight. a link down below as well. There's 3,500 of you right now. If everybody, listen, it's not hard to do, guys. If everybody that's watching live, which we'll get way more replays later, but let's just pretend only those watching live will watch this. The link is down below. If everybody jumps on there and participates, is there instructions on the website of how people can Everything, how to do it, ideas, uh, downloads for pastors, things to think about. And then we hashtag Jesus414 on that day, post a video, share something. Put the, you know, show the shirt you're wearing, Jesus 414, uh, hashtag Jesus 414, get the word out. And we don't have some big budget behind this or a PR team is just spreading the word this way. So and, uh, and with that, I'm looking at the clock. How about one last question? Yeah, we're going to do one last one here. Um, you say that God is going to keep us, but why are Christians still going to be martyred throughout the tribute or in the tribulation period? Right. Just like we're martyred now. We're never yeah. promised protection from that. We're promised protection from God's wrath. Yeah. God's wrath is never for us as people. So we are protected from that, but we're not protected from hatred, martyrdom. And ask yourself a question. 
people who were tortured to death, people who were starved to death, people whose children were taken from them and they never saw them again, uh, people who were buried alive. Is the Antichrist going to do that worse? Is it going to be worse when he buries you? I mean, we've got this mythical yeah, yeah. thing we're dealing with. The reality is that, that there, there are people that were either in, in my own ministry school that, that our team poured into and laid hands on and sent out, or where I've ministered in other nations and we've laid hands on people and sent them out. I, I can think of at least five of them that have been martyred. OK, mm. these were people that I laid. Hand, I was one of the ones laying hands on them, praying over them, sending them out. And that's just people I can attest to personally. And, and we've got friends in different parts of the world. I, I just talked to one of my closest friends in the world from India last night, and, and he was talking about the growth they're seeing in these really difficult parts in the north. And he said, brother, they don't care if they get killed, they get killed, but wow. they're preaching Jesus. And, and that's the kind of overcoming spirit. So let, let me leave with, with yeah. this word. The title of our book, Not Afraid of the Antichrist, Why We Don't Believe in a Pre-Tribulation Rapture, the title came from the publisher. Craig Keener and I wanted to use the subtitle as the main title because my purpose is not to insult you, not to say, well, you're afraid of the Antichrist if you believe in a pre-trib rapture. You might say, I'm afraid of nothing. I I'll die for Jesus tomorrow. I just believe this is what the word teaches. God bless you. I'm not here to demean you or insult you. I just want to say this. Let us all have the mentality of overcomers. Yes. The reality is in this world, we face the wrath of Satan and the wrath of man. That is a reality. Jesus never promised to protect us from that, but rather to be with us in the midst of that. So let us have the mentality of overcomers as following Jesus, whether by life or by death. Let us unite around that as we pre-trib, post-trib, either way, eagerly await the coming of the Lord. Let's shine while we yet have breath. Let's unite on those points. So good, Dr. Brown. Listen, I'm 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 converted. I'm on post trip. Here, here's why: I can't, with a good conscience, continue to preach pre-tribulation after you just destroyed every single argument that I've ever used. I mean, that's the reality of it. So, if those of you in the chat are asking, "What are you now, Isaiah?" I'm I believe in post-tribulation because I think and I believe. He laid it out clearly in scripture and I can't, again, I can't reconcile these arguments. I can't, I can't look at them and say, and with a good conscience, you know, of course with tradition you can, but with a good conscience and say, this is what the Bible says when I don't see it in the text. So for all my friends watching that are like, are you going to be converted post-trib? I am, I am officially, I do believe in a post-tribulation rapture. Dr. Brown, it has been an honor. Let me ask you one question personally. Will you come back on the show in the future if I invite you? Oh, with, with joy. And the awesome. fact that you have so many folks in the chat, listen, I wish I could answer everybody directly. My ministry is askdrbrown.org. So ask, I mean, we, we welcome it. I got my daily radio show, all, all the infos on our website, askdrbrown.org. And um, so, so we take questions. Check out the resources we have there, just like Isaiah. We've got tons of Get the of book as resources. well, right? The book on the, yeah. Not Afraid of the Antichrist. Not Afraid of the Antichrist. Get it. You'll see it's written with love and grace and filled with scripture and a lot about overcoming. You'll be encouraged just by that. But if you ever call in the radio show, if you differ with me, or want to give me a piece of your mind or tell me why you think I'm missing something, we welcome it. We, we take calls different days of the week. Every Friday, you can call and ask me a question on any subject under the sun. So interact with me. Let us be here for you. But with an audience like this, so engaged, Isaiah, it'll be my joy to come back. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Michael Brown, so much for being on. Have a great night. And then God I'll bless. be contacting your assistant about some other stuff I want to send you. Thank you so much. Sounds good. All right. God bless. God bless. What an incredible, incredible time tonight, guys. Um, just enlightenment and the word of God being preached, the text being preached. And so I'm excited. Those of you that are mad, uh, just throw your hissy fit, get over it. I want to challenge some of you that really learned from this, enjoyed it, and love what we're doing here to sow into the broadcast. I'm going to send Dr. Brown something regardless of what you give, but if you do help me by giving tonight, I will send Dr. Brown something. This is not an issue to divide over. So those of you that are manifesting and angry, just relax. Take a deep breath. You can still be pre-trip. That's totally fine. There's no judgment. There's no hate. We still love you. But again, I can't, as a Bible preacher, preach pre-tribulation after tonight, after looking at some of his content with a good conscience because my goal is to be biblical not be right so i don't mind taking down a video i don't mind explaining myself i don't mind saying hey i was wrong about this part of growing and being humble is you recognizing i don't know everything and being willing to learn and to grow so if you're not that way then you're not going to get far in the kingdom because nobody knows everything nobody has it all together so we have to remain humble so don't be mad don't be angry don't be bitter i gave dr brown all my arguments in fact 
the video I did on why I'm pre-trib, the arguments we went over tonight were exactly point by point the arguments I gave. So I specifically wanted to give them the arguments that I've used and why I've stood on those arguments. And I believe that with scripture, he explained every one of those well, and he's right. A lot of these arguments, including mine, we get from books and articles, but not the word of God. So just saying, be humble guys. Don't be prideful. Pride says, oh, you're wrong. I know it all. Just humble yourself. I know pre-trib is the popular thing. I know it's unpopular that I'm saying I'm post-trib now and whatever. It is what it is. I got to stand before God at the end of the day. I got to lay my head on my pillow tonight and be responsible for teaching the word of God accurately. And now that I've been shown this information, I've been enlightened. I'm not going to continue to preach a pre-tribulation. And again, I taught every verse out of Revelation and those areas where I was like, this doesn't make sense with pre-trib. But we teach them, we believe them because so-and-so taught, because the book we read, um, amen. Let me know, guys, what you think. Comment. I'm going to hang out here for a bit and thank everyone. If you can give, please give. We always say don't dine and dash. If you want to become a monthly partner, you can. The links are down below. You can get 70 sermons, 25% off the merch store, all that good stuff if you monthly partner. It keeps us going. All of our content is free. Maybe you're on here and you say, Isaiah, I can't believe you'd ask us to give money for this. Then my word to you is don't give any money, okay? Don't give any money. Um, if those of you that say, oh, well, you know, I don't like when preachers talk about money, don't give any money. Maybe you can't afford to give, don't give. You can enjoy this free. You got the same content those that are giving right now got. I would just encourage those, if you want to continue to see this content, bring on guests. I pay our guests, guys. I sew into them. I give them an offering. I don't, they're not coming on asking for anything, but I'm also not going to take advantage and bring people on and not give them something to compensate for their time. So, that's that. We're not beggars. We're believers. If you want to give, you can. There it is. I'm going to read some comments as you guys give, as you guys load up your apps. There's Zelle. There's Venmo. There's that. Make sure you're on the Discord. We have over 4,000 members. It's linked in the comments if you want to be a part of this community. Awesome, awesome night tonight, guys. Um, I think it was very clear. I, I just, again, I don't want to stir the pot more here. I don't really care. I always do anyways. Like, I just can't reconcile being pre-trib. I don't understand how you can preach it knowing that it's not something the bible taught it was didn't start till the 1830s i believe he said so to me a doctrine that's barely been around for a few hundred years um, is not something that i want to be standing on with confidence when it's not something that the bible explicitly teaches isaiah tomorrow for a new revelation study video imagine having to go through the reason why i wouldn't do that is because the timing of the tribute of the rapture is so small in comparison to the whole book of revelation so it doesn't hold a precedence to where, you know, I have to change all my teachings because now it's pre-trip and post-trip. In fact, when I did my entire Revelation teaching, I had about this much info, that much info on a pre-trip rapture. So it wasn't like something that I had to sit there and spend hours teaching on. Um, it was a very, very small amount. So again, don't feel the need to do that. But, and I've watched again, those of you that are saying, watch this pre-trip, I've watched all of them. Why do you think I was pre-trip? Okay, why do you think I was pre-trip? Because I watched all the videos you guys are sending me to watch. And I taught those videos. I taught what these guys teach. But then hearing a strong biblical argument, if you haven't seen Dr. Michael Brown's debates on the pre-trib versus post-trib, go watch them. They're incredibly compelling. And I think it's uh, something to think about for you. But yeah, that's that. All right, we're not doing questions anymore. So some of you, you could ask me questions, but we're not doing rapture questions any longer. Thank you for those of you that are giving. I'm going to give you guys a few more minutes to load in your donations. And then again, I'm going to be sending Dr. Brown something today. And just all I would say to you is don't be mad. There's no reason to be mad. You can stay pre-trip. That's no problem. You don't have to change. I'm not telling anybody has to. This is non-salvation. This is not something to be um, divided over. And yes, Dr. Brown is spirit-filled. He's charismatic. He, if you didn't hear, he was a part of the Brownsville Revival, which is like one of the greatest revivals in all of, all of history. And he was a part of it for years, preached at it. He's a revivalist, y'all. So don't be mistaken. Do not be mistaken. Um, someone said, I don't know. I'm still pre-trib, but I'll prepare for a post-trib. Amen, Nancy. Amen. Hope for a pre-trib, prepare for a post-trib. But yeah, just don't be mad. There's no reason to be mad. And I think, again, too, we have to remember that a lot of the stuff we defend is tradition, not scripture. Because like he said tonight, where's the scripture for that? I didn't have any. I, I've heard him debate guys that are, you know, older than him that are pre-trib. And they don't, I haven't heard him give any as well. So. Awesome. All right, let's read some of these donations tonight. I'm going to turn the, actually, the music's already on. Cool. 
And I do want to just thank Dr. Michael Brown again, because he is an absolute legend and a general. I respect him and honor him. And for him to take his time, you know, he's a very, very busy man. And for him to take his time, he's already streaming like all the time on his page. For him to come on our stream is a major sacrifice. So I don't want to undervalue that or take that lightly. All right, Craig and Heather Burke, thank you. Said we have missed you on your lives, but always listen at some point. I've been having um, health issues. Please play. We love you and your family. Craig and Heather Burke, we love you. You guys are OGs. We're praying for you. Love you and appreciate you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me ask this, okay? Let me make, <laughs> let me just make some of you more mad. If you change your view tonight, type one in the chat. That's what I want to see. I'm just curious. If you were pre-trib before and now you're post-trib, listen to Dr. Brown destroy all the arguments, type one in the chat, okay? Again, nothing to divide over, nothing to not listen. You don't need to cancel any preachers, but I want you to type one if you change your position tonight based on what you heard Dr. Michael Brown. All right, don't type two because two doesn't mean anything. I'm just curious, lots of you. That's awesome, that's good. Again, it's not a salvation issue, it is a tertiary issue. Yeah, you guys froze my thing, so amen. A lot of you were, uh, well, I guess 25% according to the poll were post-trib too. So it wasn't like, you know, some of you were just happy, like yes, post-trib, but yes. I don't mind going through the tribulation, y'all. If God, if it's our generation, our time, God will get us through it and God will use us in it and we'll see a great harvest. Amen. All right. Brooke Louie said, thanks for doing this. More people that do not agree need to start having discussion versus speaking about each other's views. I love to learn. And the only way to do that is to speak to those you don't agree with. I thank the Lord. I found your channel. Thank you, Br Brooke Louie. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shawan Young said, thank you for not shying away from a, an opposing view. I love your humility and desire for the truth above all else. God bless you. Thank you, Shawan. Guys, if you follow our channel and you've been on this journey with us, um, I've been in ministry full-time for 11 years, but I've been live streaming for over two years. My whole goal is to remain humble. That's like what I keep telling you guys. I don't want to get arrogant. I don't want to get prideful. I don't want to become a know-it-all. I don't want to become like the religious people I talk about that point their finger at everybody else that's wrong, but it's never me. I don't ever want to be that with any topic. If somebody says, this is what the Bible says, well, even if it's about deliverance, then I want to make sure that I'm biblical. The reason why I'm so confident and no one will change my mind on deliverance is because it's biblical. I could give you verse after verse after verse after verse. So I will defend it, defend it and defend it because it's, it's biblical. It's a biblical thing. So I want to make sure that I stay humble with these other issues that are not explicit. Well, I guess tonight it was, but um, again, it's, it's, you got, we got to stay humble. We can't become know-it-alls. We have to remain in humility. I think if we remain humble, God will keep blessing our ministry and blessing the live stream. And that goes for everybody, right? Those that humble themselves, God will exalt. And those that exalt themselves, God will humble, the Bible says. Jesse Ralden said, miss you, bro. Finally sold the home and bought my last retirement home. So glad to be here with these with us post-tribbers, praising the Lord. My love to the fan, spend some on the celebration dinner, come to Pennsylvania, love to sponsor. Thank you, Jesse Ralden. I appreciate you, bro. And I'd love to meet you in Pennsylvania when I get out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesse Ralden, generous donation. You're a legend, bro. I appreciate you. Miss you, man. Ray said the message was eye-opening. He annihilated our arguments. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Guys, I, I think I might be the first person to ever bring someone on and give them my, all my arguments and say, destroy these, please. Um, I don't care. I literally have no pride to salvage. I literally don't have any pride to salvage. So uh, my ego is not in the way with this. Like I gave him the arguments that I've used. Every argument that we talked about are arguments I've preached. And I'm telling you, uh, I'm on the live stream with 3000 people saying, hey, wreck my arguments. Amen. So yeah, what pride do I have to salvage? Ray, oh, okay, Ray, thank you. Angela Johnson said, thank, thank you for, I believe you're here for such a time as this. Thank you so much, Angela. Liam Thompson said, I was solid pre-trib before this and was pretty sure I would stay that way. Totally post-trib now. This was eye-opening I'm sending to all my Christian friends. Thank you, Liam Thompson. I appreciate you. You're awesome. Thank you, man. Um, <laughs> sorry. I just, I'm, I gotta stay nice here, okay? I'm gonna stay, just, I'm gonna behave myself here. Keila Lovett, thank you. So I'm a new Christian and see you as my pastor, but it didn't set right with me that I understood this issue different than you. I'm thankful you're humble and open to be taught. P.S. It was cool seeing you um, in a random parking lot without walls. Keila, thank you so much. Great seeing you at Without Walls. Thank you for the donation. I really appreciate you. And I'm glad that I'm able to help pastor you in this journey that you're on. And you can follow me as I follow Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you guys want to hang on, talk to me, I will be live for probably another 20, 30 minutes. I'll talk to you. So if you're angry, you can save it and we'll, um, we'll talk to you. Awesome. Make sure you subscribe to Dr. Michael Brown as well. 
Jennings, Jennifer said, bless you. Thank you, Jennings. Warren and Donna said, wow, thank you for stretching us to grow. I'm convinced scripture proves it and that's all I needed. Thank you, Warren and Donna. Leonette said, I wish I can give you more, but next time, God bless you. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate you, Leonette. And the answer to that is neither, okay? Neither. Marion Bond said, awesome teaching. Thank you, thank you, Marion. James Franklin, thank you. Rico so I'm convicted. Post-trib is the most biblical approach. Thankful for great teaching. God bless you, brothers. Thank you, Rico. The Davis family said the world the word always reveals truth. Thank you, Don, Jade, and Jackie Davis. Thank you so much, Davis family. I appreciate you. Listen, <laughs> if you listen to go just go listen to the debates on post-trib and pre-trib, and the post-trib debaters will say, What verse is that? There's usually not one. So I thought about that in this comment. Someone said. The word always reveals truth. Cherry said, thanks, Dr. Michael Brown and Isaiah Saldivar for the teaching. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit so strong the whole time at work. Thank you, Cherry. Cherry Lynn, thank you. Clinton Terriano said, I'm convicted. Dr. Brown's greatest weapon is his mustache. <laughs> thank you, Clint. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Maxim, I got your prayer request. Thank you. Albertson said, thank you for your humbleness. God bless you. Thank you. Patty said, God bless you. Thank you, Patty. All right, that's all the PayPal. Let us read the Venmo now, guys. Awesome, awesome night. Let me read the Venmo. I mean, yeah, the Venmo. Louise Salerzano said, you popped up on my YouTube while I was being tormented last year. I know God put you there. Um, you're a humble uh, humble follower, man of God. God bless you and family. Thank you, Louise. I appreciate you, man. Aaron Neal said, but we will give ourselves a continual prayer into the ministry of the word. Great discussion. God bless you, your household, Dr. Brown, and those who are doers of the word. Thank you, Aaron. And again, I will be sending Dr. Brown a offering tonight to bless him and his ministry. So... A portion of everything that comes in tonight will go towards him as per usual with our guests. Okay, let's check out the Venmo here. See what we got going here. All right, let's see. Larissa said, "Post trip, buddy. No magic school. No magic bus coming before persecution starts. Let's put on our armor and be ready and counted an honor to suffer or die for Christ." Amen. Thank you, Larissa. Excuse me, guys. Velda Anderson said, hearing the word. Thank you, Velda. Tanya said, sowing seeds. Blessed by the teaching tonight. Thank you, Isaiah. God bless you and family. Thank you, Tanya. Myra said, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Myra. Lori said, thank you, Isaiah. post trip Let's go. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lori. Cynthia Bird. Hey, it's me, Cindy on Hobbs from YouTube. So this means I have to start preparing and buying armor to protect from these horrid... Oops. Locust. I'm feeling a little upset about the locust. Good stream, brother. Uh, good stream, though, brother. Thank you for all you do. As Dr. Brown said, God will protect you from the wrath. So if the locusts are bringing the wrath of God and torturing, Christians are going to be protected, as we've said before. So don't stress out about it, Cindy on Hobbs. Keep doing what you're doing. Peter says that while we wait for the coming of the Lord to live pure, blameless, and peaceful lives. So that is your job. Pure, blameless, and peaceful lives. That's what we should all be doing before the Lord comes. No worry. Don't worry about prepping, buying body armor. Um, God will protect you. And if you're, if God if you're the will for your life or God's plan for your life is that you'd be martyred, God would see you through just like all the other millions that have been martyred in history. God will see you through. And guys, when we get saved, we say, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. So we can't say that and then uh, be like, oh no, I have to actually do it. Rachel Hecker, thank you. Said amazing, encouraging teachings. Joy Rogers said, Dr. Brown uh, live stream so much, so makes complete sense. Thank you, Joy. Brenda, so God bless you for accepting correction and walking in humility, brother. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Brendan. I love your whole family. Victor said, so for being a man of God, not, uh, not only our eyes, but our hearts to the Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Victor and Brenda. I appreciate you both. You're awesome. Lorianne Reese said, so I'm now post. I wasn't pre. I was undecided. Thank you, Lorianne. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, the donation. Sarah Butler said, so I'm officially post-trib now. Great content. Well, now I'm like, buckle up, buttercup, because we're here for the long haul. But praise God, we can help bring more souls to the kingdom. Thanks for doing what you do. You help me humble myself and remain teachable and not knowing it all. Thank you, Sarah Butler. I appreciate you. Yes. I'm sure I'm going to have plenty of texts from friends of mine that are very happy tonight. Gabby Hildalgo. So keep pushing through the hate pastor. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you, Gabby. Guys, I'm not out of touch. Okay. Um, I know that it's opposite of what I've taught. I know that it's unpopular. I know that 75% of you that were watching were pre-trip. So it's not like I'm shocked that some of you are mad or whatever. It, it's, uh, I would rather be biblical than be a people pleaser. And that's my end goal is how close can we get to the Bible? Gilda Moreno said, tonight's teaching was very eye-opening and very blessed to have learned a lot. Thank you for your humbleness and your obedience to your calling. Your ministry has been such a blessing. There's a really good video. I wonder, let's see. I want to really find this for you guys. 
Dr. Michael Brown. Let me see if I can find this because this is a really, really good video that goes into even more detail. That was streamed last year. Here it is. Let me find it. Let me post this video in the chat for you guys because I think you'll really like this video. It goes into a lot more depth and it's a debate. So the guy that's talking to him was actually you know, arguing his case. But let me just get you guys this video. I just posted it in the comments. Check that video out. It's a debate he did. It's like a two and a half hour video on pre-trib and post-trib. I think it's very helpful. And it's uh, about what we talked about tonight, but he's debating somebody that wrote a book on the pre-trib. So really interesting. Again, after his opening statement, I was thinking like, how is this guy going to say anything about what Dr. Michael Brown said? Okay. Death is gain. Amen. We literally have a shirt on a merch store that says death is gain. Okay, I'm just reading the comments here. Lots of comments. Are you going to remove your videos due to the pre-trib now? I have one video on why I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And yes, I will take it down because um, I don't believe that anymore. I just gave him all my arguments in that video and he gave me and he destroyed them. So why would I keep the video up? I could also do another video on why I took that video down and changed, but I don't know. Is that even necessary? I have a, I have this live stream up that people can watch. But yeah, I can make another video explaining it too if you guys want. And then point people to this video. What do you guys think? You tell me. What do you mean by death is gain? Death is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Death is graduation for the believer because we end up in heaven with Christ. Yes, our goal needs to be evangelize and reach people. We shouldn't be so stressed out about when the rapture is. Make another video explaining it. Not necessary. Are you going to do one now on why you're post-trib? Um, I could. I could make a new video. Please do another video on it. But my other video on it is just going to be me talking about this video and why. But we could, you know, this is a, an hour or two hour almost video. But the title, you know, is about Dr. Michael Brown. So maybe it'll be good to um, explain it. Um, the Way World Outreach, the address on my website is the right one. Isaiah Valdez, the, I have the address on my website. It's the, it's the right address. It's the large campus. If you're asking about that, let me just double check it for you. Make sure I have the right address. Uh, the Way World Outreach. Let's click it here. Hallmark Parkway is 4680 Hallmark Parkway is the right address. Okay. That's going to be the one. Isaiah, you were a preacher. When did you switch? I switched tonight. That's when I switched. I switched after I gave Dr. Michael Brown my seven arguments I used in my video and he tore every single one of them apart. That's why. That's when I switched. If I can't biblically back up my argument, why would I re remain? Uh, why would I continue in that doctrine? Daniel Adams, thank you, bro. You're a legend, man. Thanks for always supporting financially, man. Said about that revival life. I really appreciate you, Daniel Adams. My wife said, hurry and end so I can rewatch it. I will be off soon. I will be off soon. My mind is blown. Amen. In what car were the apostles when they were filled with the Holy Spirit? I believe they're in a Honda Accord. Is that right? One Accord. I don't know. Honda Accord, something like that. I don't remember the joke. And guys, again, Dr. Michael Brown taught on a rapture. There is a rapture. There is a taking People of God, we're not arguing that, but the point is we meet him in the air and then we come back with him at his coming. So that's the thing. What if you're wrong? Then I get raptured before the tribulation. Praise the Lord. If I'm wrong, then I get taken up in the rapture because I'm a believer. So praise the Lord if I'm wrong. He was so chill about converting. It's not a salvation issue, guys. It's not like I'm converting to Islam live on broadcast. It's just a secondary doctrine, non-salvation doctrine. Uh, what happened to Luke Holter? Uh, he had a, a family emergency come up and I'm waiting to get a date from him. That's what happened. 
He already talked about Revelation 3.10 twice in the video, so if you want to go back, you can find it. He talked about that verse two times. Man, I'm greasy. I'm sweating, man. What's the song playing in the background? It's just not, it's just a copyright free instrumental. I don't even know the name. Bring him back, Isaiah. I'm I will invite him back on for sure. I'm Trinitarian, so um yeah, I believe in the Trinity. I've never seen this happen before, and I'm so thankful because I knew it would happen. I knew Isaiah was a humble man. Thank you, Jackie Pittman. Trust me, guys. I'm willing. If I'm teaching something that doesn't line up with scripture, I'm willing to change. No problem. Vera Conception, thank you so much. Some of you thought I was going to debate Dr. Michael Brown. Me debate Michael, Dr. Michael Brown? Again, that's like me trying to get in the ring with a world-class boxer and I've never trained a day in my life. What are you talking about? Isaiah, you gain weight. You have cheeks now. <laughs> Trust me, I didn't gain weight. I wish I did. I have not gained any weight. It must just be the camera angle, the lights, or, or something. I don't know. But I definitely haven't gained weight. I've actually lost weight. Those lights must give off mad heat. They don't really give up that much heat. They're all LED. It's just hot in the room because actually what puts out heat is my computer. My computer's like a toaster oven and it's just nonstop spitting out heat. Yeah. Uh, resist. Yes. Welcome. I'm trying to read these guys. There's so many comments coming in. I was scared for you if you were going to debate Dr. Michael Brown. Yeah, trust me, that wasn't going to happen. All right, my kids want to come say hi to you guys. So let me, let me see. Is this the right camera? Hmm. Nope, that's the wrong camera. Oh, you know what? Will that work? That might work. I should have put a different, I should have put a different uh, lens on. All right, Alyssa, you can bring them in. If you're watching, which I guess you are, right? Because you're in the comments and you text me. The kids are going to come say hi to you guys. I hope this... I might have to switch... Let me see. I could switch the camera here. That might be better. We'll try this one first. Yes, hopefully I'm getting my braces off soon. I got braces for two months on my bottom teeth. The devil is a liar and hopefully I get them off soon. I didn't visit line for two years and there was one tooth that just wouldn't move, so... Do you travel and preach in different cities? Yes. Your face does look fuller. What? Guys, I've lost weight. How does my face look fuller? But okay. The video at Remnant Radio was good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right, ladies, come say hi. Hi. <laughs> All right, the kids are coming in. You know what? Let me change the camera angle, girls. Hold on. Let me change this angle. There we go. Okay. We got a whole tribe, y'all. We got a whole tribe. Okay. Okay, okay. Be careful your feet, girls. Be careful your feet. Hold on. We're going to try to get them all in. Hold on. Hold on. Were you eating Oreos, girl? You already know Harvey always has food on her face. I ate ice cream. Oh, you had ice cream? Wow. And you did too, Nova? She did. Wow. This is the whole squad. I'm telling y'all, I have a tribe. I have a tribe. Can you guys all say your names, please? My, I'm Harvest. What's your name? Harvest. Okay, in the mic. Justice. Okay, in the mic. Harvest. Journey. Say Novi. What about Novi? Novi. Hi, Mama. Oh, mwah. thank you, baby. Harvest, I gotta get down. Nova, Justice, Journey, and Alyssa. Oh, thank you, baby. I love you. I love you. Okay. Hi. Okay, baby. Oh, Hi. thank you. You get, who are you kissing? My arm? Jordy, you see yourself? Yeah. You're making faces, Justice. Thank you, baby. You're kissing my hands. I love you. I love you. Journey, you wiggling your tooth? Nova took off. There she is. Yeah, look at all the emojis. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm telling you guys, we have a tribe. We literally have a tribe. This is a... No, 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 no,
You can't press. You guys can't press. You're gonna end the stream. If that stream ends right now, it was because one of the kids pressed something. Everybody say hi to Auntie Lexi. Hi, Auntie Lexi. And Nate. And Nate. And Nate. Hi, 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 Nate. Okay, you want to show the camera that? Mm -hmm. Bobblehead. Bobblehead. I want to show the bobblehead. There you go. I want to show the bobblehead. I want to show the bobblehead. Did you guys all have ice cream? I did. 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 I we're gonna get off here. We're gonna go hang out with the kids. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Tonight was amazing. No more children in Jesus' name. We love our kids, but I think we have a full, full plate here. Everybody say bye. bye. Say love you guys. Bye. 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 Love you guys. Say Jesus is king. Jesus is king. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Harvey, I mean Nova, say hallelujah. All right. Love you guys. We'll see you guys bye. on Friday. Oh, no, don't press that. We'll see you guys on Friday night. Friday, bye, Love you guys. Bye. bye. Hold on. Bye, don't press that. Don't press that. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Love you all. Bye. See ya. Ow, ow, ow. Bye. 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 Love you guys. Journey, journey, stop. Bye. Love you guys. We did. We showed it. All right, guys. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Bye.